Okay, um, as we are admitting people, I just want to say welcome on behalf of UJA JCC Greenwich. I really want to thank um, Carolyn Surgent and Jacques Friedman who brought this program to us and who are chairing tonight. And um, I think it's so important because who doesn't want to make their Passover Seder a great night? Um, so thank you for doing that. The housekeeping is the usual. We're going to ask you to stay on mute. However, uh, what we are going to do is if you do have a question at any time, don't wait for the end. Please put it in the chat and Carolyn will moderate the questions and interrupt as needed. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jacques Friedman uh, to introduce Mark. Great. Uh, thank you, Pam. Uh, we're honored tonight to have Mark Gerson here to present his book, The Telling, on the lessons we can learn from the Haggadah uh, in the everyday life. Uh, you know, looking over Mark's bio and a short intro, really can't do Mark justice. Uh, Mark is an entrepreneur, he's an author, he's a philanthropist, an investor, uh, and maybe most importantly, he's a rabbi's husband and a, and a host of the popular podcast, The Rabbi's Husband. Um, uh, in, in the business world, he's, he's most well known for being a co-founder of the Gerson Lehrman Group and has also been a seed investor uh, in, in, in companies across many different industries. On the philanthropy side, he, he's proud of being a co-founder and chairman of United Hatzalah, which is a, a system of first response sort of ambulance type vehicles that enable Israelis to be treated very quickly within moments of, uh, of, of being injured and, and trauma. He's also done a lot of work in Africa, chairman of the African Mission Healthcare, which enables medical missionaries to provide crucial care uh, to people throughout Africa. Um, so, so Mark is, has really made a lot of contributions across uh, a lot of different walks of life. We're really excited to have him talk today about his book. Uh, I, I met him very recently and, and, and just saw his background on his uh, uh, on the Zoom, and I and I asked him about the book, and I thought it'd be a really great uh, event for us in Greenwich, especially as we go into uh, Pesach season, uh, to hear about the Haggadah and Mark's perspective. So, Mark, uh, please uh, take it away. Uh, well, uh, Jacques and Carolyn, thank you so much, and Pam, thank you. Um, now, so we're going to talk tonight about the Haggadah, which is a subject of my book, The Telling. Now, one of the many interesting things about the Haggadah is that it can never be finished. So I wrote a book about the Haggadah, but I didn't finish the book. I submitted it. And then a week later, I opened up a, a doc to include things I've learned subsequently for the next edition. So we could come to this, an event like this every night for the next dozens of years and still not nearly have exhausted the highly practical wisdom in the Haggadah. Therefore, we're not gonna do it tonight. So ask any question in the middle. There's no notion of interrupting. We're not gonna to get to a fraction of what we would like to anyway. So any questions about your favorite part of the Seder, the most interesting, intriguing, disturbing, just put it in the chat, ask the question and we can uh, take it from there and make this very interactive because there's absolutely no set program. We, we could open up and talk about any passage in this great book, uh, that's the Haggadah. And it is really a great book. I think it's um, the greatest book word for word ever written. Um, I think it is, but before, in order to understand why, I think we first have to consider as we do with any book, what is the genre of the book? So the first thing, this is not, it's not a dinner program. It's not an instruction manual. It's not a holiday manual. It's not a law book or a cookbook and certainly not a history book. It's a guidebook. And what's it a guidebook for? It's a guidebook for the Seder, but it's also a guidebook for life. And how is that? And to understand that key function of the Haggadah, we first have to realize what Passover or more properly Pesach really is. Pesach is the biblically ordained and authentic Jewish New Year, not Rosh Hashanah, which doesn't even make a mention in the Torah. Pesach is the genuine Jewish New Year. Of course, we can still celebrate Rosh Hashanah. We have multiple New Years as Jews. We do so as Americans as well. We have January 1st. We have our national New Year on July 4th. We have our personal new year on our birthday. We have our relationship new year on our anniversary. We have a fiscal new year, all of which teaches us that the opportunity afforded by a new year is too great to happen only once every 12 months. But the real Jewish new year 
is Pesach. And it also doubles as another major event in the year, which is every culture has a spring festival. Our spring festival as Jews is Pesach. The Bible tells us this shall occur in the month of spring. We have a leap month, seven out of every 19 years to affix Pesach in the spring and thus to have the Jewish calendar revolve around Pesach and Jewish life revolve around Pesach. In America, we have a spring festival too, it's opening day. So how do we feel on, on opening day? How do we feel on Pesach? We literally go outside again. We feel rejuvenated. We feel renewed. In Israel, 500 million birds cross over. The feeling of opportunity is in the air. And that's what we should, That's how we should conceive a new year. We should take inventory of who we are now. And we should consider with the aid of this great guidebook, who we want to be both personally, collectively, and nationally in the coming year. So we can um, open the Haggadah. And, and again, with any questions about the Haggadah, this is as good a time as any, just a favorite passage. We're going to go through some passages. So, uh, okay, uh, we'll start with Pam. Okay. Good. We'll start with the wicked son. I've been searching for a good reason for the harsh response to the wicked son. All right, that's great because the response actually, it's totally loving. It's not harsh. But okay, so and so we, we will we will explain why. All right, the the wicked son. All right, the first but the first thing is we have of course four sons. So why four sons? And I believe we have four because the night is too short to have four hundred million sons. Because one would think that a faith tradition would say, give me the question, I'll give you the answer. But instead, what's interesting is we have multiple children. And so what is the, what are the authors of the Haggadah teaching us through multiple children? What they're teaching us is that our God, our one God is a big God that people experience in different ways, 400 million ways, because God made each of us unique. Therefore, each child is going to experience God differently. And the great Christian historian Paul Johnson said, Judaism is the perfectly constructed machine for the mass production of intellectuals. And he's probably right. But it's not by no means is it the only or even the best way to experience God. It's just one way. So right now I'm, I'm enjoying already just a, an intellectual exchange. Some people may have signed off and said, you know what? It's too intellectual. I experience God musically or I experience God mystically or someone else might say, I'm going to go build something for God because that's how I experience God. So the existence of four children tells us there's an infinite number of ways to experience God. And we think about educating our children. We should do so with that in mind. OK, so the wicked son. What does he say? Of what purpose is this work to you? He says to you, thereby excluding himself. By excluding himself from the community of believers, he denies the basic principle of Judaism. So here the authors of the Haggadah step out of their usual role in telling the story of the Exodus and enabling us to relive and retell the story, and they become pundits. They base the question the pundit asks, imagine like a Sunday morning TV show, what's the basic principle of Judaism? In come the authors of the Haggadah and they tell us, the basic principle of Judaism is the community. And this is such an important fact for us to consider now as Jews and as Americans, because no matter what arguments or disputations or disputes or questions that we have among Jews or among Americans, in come the authors of the Haggadah and say, never let any of those threaten the community. So never let any dispute threaten the community. And in fact, the Rebbe Menachem Shearson, he was exchanging letters at one point in the 70s with a scientist on some issue. I'm not sure exactly what it was. It may have been evolution or something. And he stopped the letter exchange. And then years later, his correspondent said to him, why did you stop the exchange? He said, because I saw it was threatening a relationship. And so what we learn here is the community is the most important thing. So at, by this point in the Seder, there should be lots of discussion, argumentation, disputes. None of it should threaten the community. But the wicked son, that's what he does. He separates himself from the community. And that's the worst thing he could do. OK, so therefore, what should what's the instruction? And, and, and this is what is sometimes interpreted as as harsh. And we'll see why it's interpreted that way, but why it's really not that at all. Therefore, blunt his teeth and tell him. Now, blunt his teeth does not mean hit him in the face. We know that because blunt his teeth is a reference from both Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where it says the opposite. It says the father ate sour grapes and the son's teeth was blunted. In other words, it's the opposite. The father's not hitting him in the face. The father's taking the blame. The father's saying, I ate sour grapes, and therefore my son is acting this way. And Rabbi Sachs, in his brilliant discussion of this, he says, how can Jews understand this in the context of a Seder? He said, maybe you as a parent said, sent the message to your child directly or otherwise that soccer practice is more important than Jewish learning. Maybe you just didn't, never did anything for Shabbat, and now you expect your kid to be all respectful at the Passover Seder. 
So he said, it's, this is an opportunity to think about ourselves and what we did wrong. And of course, the best time to do that is when our kids are small, right? Think about how might my child become wicked because of something I do in the future when they're way too young to be wicked and then do the opposite. So the father is taking the blame. He's not hitting the sign of the mouth. And then he says, and this is, I think is a beautiful line. He said, it is because of this that Hashem did so for me when I went out of Egypt. Now, what's this? This is the discussion with the wicked son. So what he's telling the wicked son, or particularly as I emphasize to Christian groups, this could be the wayward child. This is by no means is limited to the Seder. This is instructing us as to how to deal with the wayward child. And so what the parent is saying is, it is because of this, it is because of your wickedness that God made me free. My purpose in life, the parent is telling the child, is to redeem you. So let's get out of this together. And just we can imagine how a wicked son or a wayward child would respond to the parent taking the blame and, not, and then saying, "My, I love you so much that my entire purpose in life is to redeem you. Now, another context of the wicked son is how bad is he? Well, it, he's pretty bad. It's a bad question he asks. However, what is his redeeming virtue is that he's there, right? Now, when we conceive of the wicked son, we have to ask ourselves, how old is he? Well, if he's three or four, he can't be because he asks a fairly sophisticated question. Three and four-year-olds don't ask, high, they ask interesting questions, but not very nuanced and sophisticated questions. This one is nuanced and sophisticated. So this is not a three or four-year-old child. Now with a three or four-year-old, uh, you can we can of course make the three or four-year-old be wherever we want them to be, right? Not that hard. We can't really do that with a 16 or 17-year-old. This son is clearly in his late adolescence because he's asking a fairly sophisticated question, or maybe he's even older. We can't force a 17 year old to be where, we, where he doesn't want to be. So the redeeming thing about the wicked son is he has chosen to be the Seder. So who's the truly tragic son? It's the fifth son, the son who's not there. If the son has chosen not to be there, the daughter, of course, we, we don't have a lifeline to them. But by the fact that the son has chosen to be there, he has told us there is something in Judaism that makes me want to be at the Seder. And maybe he doesn't know what it is, but he knows there's something there because he's chosen to spend the night with us. All right, um, any other questions or should we continue through uh, another passage? Um, all right, let's just continue through the, let's go through the son, the sons. The, uh, so the wise son obviously precedes the simple son, the wicked son. What does he say? What are the testimonies, decrees, and ordinances which Hashem, our God, has commanded you? A good Jewish question, a very good one, in fact, but we'll see, imperfect. He said he wants to learn everything his parents know. He wants to know the testimonies of decrees and ordinances. He accepts God, which Hashem, our God, has commanded you. Now, especially this is so interesting when I speak to Christian groups. Why does he say has commanded you? One would think he would say has commanded us. Well, we Jews in the Hebrew, we have no word for obedience. There's no Hebrew word for obedience. So there's and, and when the language has no word for something, it has no concept of the thing. So. He would not say has commanded us because not only is he under no obligation to obey his parents, there is no idea of what that might be. So I think this is a deeply instructive to all of us parents who, and we're blessed with four children, who want our kids to grow up and to be good, proud Jews. Now, my wife, as Jock said, is a rabbi, right? So we talk about this, these kinds of things with some frequency. And we say, do we want our children to have the same kind of Jewish home that we do? And the answer is absolutely not. Well, why? If we thought there is there a better way? If we thought there was a better way, we would do that way. But what we do is we recognize that God made each child in a sacred, unique way. And we want our children asking questions like this. Because when a child asks a question like this, the answer is highly unlikely to be, Mom and Dad, everything you did you did for you is exactly right for me. But when you're comfortable in your product, as we should be in Judaism, we welcome the fact that the answers are going to be slightly different from those that we came up with. And they're going to land in a slightly different Jewish place. They're going to, God willing, land in a Jewish place, but it'll be a different place than we did, and we'll we'll behold it. But that's what the parents comfortable with. They're comfortable with the to you. That is, he's not criticized for that anywhere. That's a good part of the question. Is that he does not say has commanded us, but has commanded you. He will make up his own mind. And as parents, we're confident that his decision, the result of him making up his own mind, will land him in a place that we can be proud of. But the question is imperfect. Therefore, explain to him the laws of the Passover offering that one may not eat dessert after the final taste of the Passover offering. So why is the answer about dessert? The question had nothing to do with dessert or any other kind of food. And I think what it's teaching us is that what does the son fail to ask? He fails to ask about how will any of these ideas actually operate in practice? In other words, 
He does not apply the taste test. Now, Orwell has this awesome essay from 1946, which everybody should read, Politics in the English Language. Particularly now it's important. And he goes through the five rules of English writing. And at the end of the essay, he says, if complying with any of these rules would produce a barbaric outcome, violate the rule. It's the same thing here. If any of these the testimonies, decrees, and ordinances won't work in real life, forget the rule. And the son, despite the fact that he asks a good question, he misses that crucial part. And therefore, the parent lovingly instructs him. All right, now we're going to go to the misunderstood son, otherwise known as the uh, simple son. Now, the one thing that I know for sure about the uh, simple son is that he's not stupid. So people who interpret him as stupid, that, that, that is just, we can say categorically that's wrong because simple means Tom, the Hebrew word is Tom. And in the Bible, the Torah, God says, be Tamim with me. He's not saying be stupid with me. He's saying be wholehearted. And so who is the wholehearted son? Well, we know and love this person. This, this son, he, he, he may have signed off by now because he, he does not access God through textual study and these kinds of distinctions that make for Jewish learning. But this is the person who throws a 4th of July barbecue that everyone loves. This is the person who volunteers for anything and everything. This is the person who, if you have to drop your kid off somewhere in a pinch, you know, it doesn't matter how well you know him or her, your kid will have a great, great time. This is the salt of the earth. This is the pillar of the community. So one question I like to ask the young women at my seders, and um, as a father of two daughters, I could begin to think about it myself, although they're very young, is would you rather marry the wholehearted son or the wise son? And as the father of two daughters and two sons, I say all day, I go with the wholehearted son, all day, no question. That being said, about 30 to 40% of people disagree with me. So it's an interest, it's an, it, I think it's, it's not just like a parlor game, it's actually a very useful technique to concentrate people's minds as to what do they really seek in a spouse? Is it the wholeheartedness or is it the wise son? And of course people are complicated and can be a mixture. Now, the son who's unable to ask, again, this is a misunderstood son because this son is not three years old. Why? Because again, he asks a sophisticated question and won't, and all, the only way we, we can educate a really small child is by letting them hear the music, smell the smells, and really feel the love at the Seder and just see the relationships and assimilate that into their Jewish understanding, however they do it. So what's, so who's the son who's unable to ask if it's not a small child? Well, the great Rav Levi of Berdichev, one of the greats from the 19th century, when he came to this part of his Haggadah, he would get very prayerful and very serious until someone at the Seder said to him, Rav Levi, like, why are you getting so serious and even emotional at this point? This is about the kids. He said, no. He said, I'm the son who's unable to ask. He said, right now, I'm praying to God to give me the strength and the wisdom and the understanding to ask the right questions. So I think when we come to this, we can acknowledge each of us is the son or daughter who's unable to ask. Now, this is everything in the Haggadah exists to serve a highly concrete, very practical purpose. What's the purpose of that? When we think about the mistakes that we made in our lives, almost all of them come from not asking the right question. Once we get the right question, the answers are usually very easy. It's the questions that are hard to come by. So as we approach the new year, which we'll be doing on March 27th, because Pesach is a Jewish new year, as we approach the new year, one thing we can think is, what questions should I be asking? both about myself spiritually, about the world materially. What are the questions I should be asking that I might not be asking? Because if I'm not asking the right questions, I'm not gonna go in the right direction. So what are the right questions? Because I think we are all this child. Mark, um, a question came in. I wonder if you can comment just on the, uh, the historical context of when the Haggadah became the guide that people use at the Seder. Was it like a Ashkenazi tradition, Sephardic tradition, or do you, you know any you know any idea about the history? Yeah, the, the, the history is a little, well, like most ancient things, it's not, we don't have any, we don't know about it with any precision. But what we do know is that if we go to Exodus, and this is the amazing thing, the, the, the Seder is the longest running religious ritual in the history of the world. And we know this because if we go to the Exodus text, Exodus 12 and 13, everything we're doing on Seder night is imitating the last meal in Egypt in Exodus 12 and 13. So there must have been some Seder-like experience from Moses in Exodus 12 and 13 till us today that of course evolved over time. But the differences between the Seder that we're gonna have on March 27th and the one that Jesus might've had, to me, they're much less interesting than the continuity in that it's remarkable that we and people literally 90 or hundred generations ago, which is an inconceivably long amount of time, doesn't sound like that big a number, it's 6,000 years. 
it's an inconceivably long amount of time. The, the Haggadah is what has kept us literally on the same page in that we are enjoying a conversation with our ancestors from long ago and with Jews around the world. So it's a vertical conversation and it's a horizontal conversation. And um, there are differences in practice, but what's so interesting is that we can learn about the Seder from Maimonides, who was a Sephardic Jew in the 1100s, 1200s. I mean, we can, is that, is the learning we can do from the standpoint of continuity and what, what and that we're asking the same questions. To some extent, we're singing the same songs. We're certainly learning the same story and we're seeking the same understanding in pretty much the same way that our great, great, great times 10 grandparents did. And that's, that's an awesome thing to behold. Okay, can, can you give some examples of how we can simplify the Seder? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in, like in the book, I have like 50 or 55 chapters or something like that. Analyzing, just like we did with the four sons, I think there's one chapter on each of the, the, the sons. I would say two things to that really important question. And actually I'll answer the question by talking about the four questions, because I think that really answers Randy's question. So let's just briefly discuss the four questions, which I presume are familiar to everybody here. On all the nights we eat hamed samasa, and this night only masa. On all the nights we eat many vegetables, and this night we eat maror. Then we have one about dipping, and then we have one about reclining. Now, has anybody here ever been to a Seder? Wait, we just preface that by saying, the purpose of these questions is to arouse the interest of the children. That being said, has anybody here been to a Seder where a child has leapt from her chair and said, oh my God, we're dipping twice. Tell me about the Exodus. I posit that has never happened. And it's not like kids these days are so jaded by social media, they don't appreciate dipping like my grandparents did. Our grandparents didn't either. We know that because the greatest rabbis of yore, there's records of the things they did. They used toasted grains, they used popcorn. I learned the other day in a, a session with MJE that uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik's grandfather, who was a great rabbi, he would come into the Seder, I think uh, wearing like a pot on his head or something like that. Is that, so why do they do this? They did this because these four questions are mediocre, right? They, they never aroused anyone's interest. And that leads to the question, well, why didn't some smart person in the last 2000 years come up with four better questions? And the answer is because there are not four better generic questions that when we want to educate our children as it is our sacred duty as parents to do, we have to do it ourselves with regard to the uniqueness of each child. So generic questions are always bad and that's okay because as parents and as educators, formal or informal, we have to think what is the unique access point to this child for this subject? There's gonna be one, then do it. So I think when, so uh, one way that we can make it meaningful is to really respect, you know, and the only way that respect can be demonstrated through action, the uniqueness of each child. So consider the specific children who are gonna be at the Seder and think about what is special and unique about each of them and craft the Seder accordingly. Now, use the traditional Haggadah, but craft the Seder, what does it mean craft the Seder accordingly? Well, the chapter in my book on this is called Why Whoopee Cushions Are Kosher for Passover, right? So if a child is mischievous, then when she asks a good que question, put a whoopee cushion under her chair. If a child loves baseball, it is the spring American Spring Festival, so the timing is gonna be right, then give her a pack of baseball cards if she asks a couple of good questions. What we do is when our children ask a good question, we throw marshmallows at them. Why is different this night different from all other nights? On most nights, my parents and their friends don't throw marshmallows at me, but on this night they're doing it. If a kid loves sweets, put ice cream on her plate before dinner. Um, so, but think about what are the unique access points for each child and show that child the respect and the love by speaking to them specifically. Now, this also answers the question I think about Dayenu. So Dayenu is a beautiful, it's a, it's a really good song. It's even better in its meaning. So one of the interesting things about Dayenu, and there are a few, but one of the really interesting things is that we are expressing our appreciation for God in 15 different ways. There are 15 verses. Leading to the question, why didn't we just say, hey God, thanks for everything? right? Everything would have encompassed anything. So why not just thanks for everything? And it's teaching us that when we want to express gratitude or love or appreciation, we should again do so in the specific. So everything in the Haggadah exists to teach us a lesson. This teaches us how do I express gratitude? So think about if you throw a dinner party or throw a Seder and the next morning someone sends you an email, hey, thanks for a great night. Okay. What they say, hey, that question that Yael asked, that was so on point. I'm still thinking about it today. Or your son's insight into the simple son, you know, that, that was really smart or that the food that you made was just great. I'm, whatever it is, 
gratitude, love, and appreciation is expressed in the specific. And in fact, all great love songs acknowledge this. It's uh, Prince, it's the Raspberry Beret, right? It's not the girl's beautiful, it's the Raspberry Beret that he noticed. It's uh, the way you wear your hair, the way we dance till three. It's it's whenever we want to express love and appreciation, we do so in a memorable way, it's in the specific. So I think one way to make the Seder meaningful is to, we're not gonna have an infinite number of people at Seder, even for getting this year. Now, we should have many people because in the Bible, it tells us that there can be no leftovers at a Seder meal. Um, and that if one household is too small to consume a lamb by itself, and it took 15 to 20 people to consume a lamb, that household had to invite another household, thus making Seder night the first night of Jewish peoplehood, that of giving and sharing and hospitality. But there aren't gonna be that many people there. So we can certainly think about the uniqueness of each person and craft the Seder even in a small way, in a way that's responsive to that uniqueness and everyone will love it and it'll be totally meaningful. And, uh, and the other thing is like, don't get lost in the details. Like, you know, I was actually on a, a radio show and I learned so much with every, every time I'm so blessed to be able to have a discussion about this awesome subject. I was on a radio show and the radio host, it was an ortho orthodox show. The radio show host said, you know, I'm so, he said, it's, it's interesting to see your enthusiasm about the Seder. He said, because uh, it's pretty like a lot of us dread it, like all this stuff you got to do to prepare. And I said, no, well, if, then, 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 then the interpretation of the preparation is wrong right? It should be the greatest night of the Jewish year, and we prepare to serve the great night. If the preparation becomes a source of dread, then, then let's reconsider how we're preparing, and let's reconsider. And so the Seder should be a night of kind of existential discovery of great learning that should inspire people for the year to come. And so however we can do that with regards to specific guests there, um, that, that's what we should do. Mark, I have a question for you. It's a personal question to you and sure. share in whatever context you are, you're comfortable. So a night of great learning, can you share an experience from one of your seders that was remarkable as an opportunity for you to learn? Yeah, like it's, well, the one we just talked about actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the example I'll give is from a Gentile and that's not a coincidence mm -hmm. is that putting COVID aside, I mean, so let's say for next year, I think it's incumbent upon us to have Gentiles that are seders. One, it imitates what happened in Exodus 12, when the Seder, the last meal in Egypt was enjoyed by Jews and the mixed multitudes. And more practically, it is very often the Gentile who comes to the Seder with Seder experience with total freshness, maybe never been before. By the way, they, they love the whole thing, like the, the, they love it. So just their, their love and enthusiasm for it is inspiring, particularly to the children. And they come with fresh insights and new observations and wisdom from their tradition and really enrich and live in the evening. So definitely always have Gentiles for both the biblical and a highly practical reason. So the, the, the Prince example I just gave, that was uh, Corey Booker's been coming to my Seder every year from 97 till until 2020 when he was in Iowa. And that was, um, but we're gonna resume next year. And that was, uh, that was his observation. You know, he's the one we're talking about the specificity in Dianu. He said, yes, it's Prince's Raspberry Beret. And uh, um, so, but when, we, when you open the discussion like that, particularly when they're Gentiles there, um, but of course not only, but definitely particularly new insights into the text will come. And actually, you know, I was speaking with um, a group of uh, uh, bishops from Western New York, uh, bishops and other evangelical leaders from Western New York yesterday. And uh, one of the leaders I was speaking to, he's a bishop in the in the uh, Kojic, which is the Church of God in Christ, which is um, an African-American church with as many members as there are Jews in the United States. And what he says is, he said, and he had just, uh, great insight, and I'm going to include the next edition of the book. He said that the Exodus is such a great story because everyone can experience it in their own way and with such meaning. So once we tell the story of the Exodus, which we should do with the Seder, people are going to see it and feel it in themselves, in their own way, and they're going to bring those personal observations and feelings about the Exodus, if we tell the story, to the table and thus really enrich the evening. So once we tell the story of the Exodus, it is the world's great story. The greatest story of all time will never be beaten. It's the greatest story of all time. So many stories are told through it, which was um, this, uh, Michael's point. Um, all right, and, and anything else from the, uh, 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 any other favorite passages? Because they're all awesome, every one of them, every passage. Um, I think okay, that so, means you get to pick, Mark. Okay, all right, I'll pick, I'll pick, all right. Okay, so, all right, here, let's pick this. 
Everyone know this Kadej or Kats, Karpats, when we sing that part at the beginning? Okay, it's very strange. I don't expect to get any emails about my book saying, I really enjoy the table of contents. Like, no one's going to say that. It's not because my table of contents aren't any good. They're probably good enough. It's because that's not how we relate to a book. Yet, when we come to the Seder, not only do we read the table of contents, we sing the table of contents, which is bizarre. Because if, if anyone picked up my book in Barnes & Noble and started singing the table of contents, we would think that we would have to think, wait, what, what is going on? Why are they singing the table of contents at the bookstore? Nobody would do it. So why are, if nobody would do it at a bookstore, why are we singing the table of contents at the Seder? And that relates to the, the heading on the table of contents, which is the order of the Seder. Very bizarre locution because the word Seder means order. So we just said the order of the order, and then we sing the table of contents. The table of contents, of course, order a book. So we just respected the table of contents by singing them. What is going on? Particularly because Pesach is our festival of freedom. This is the night when we're celebrating and learning about our freedom. So why are we glorifying order? Or opposite from free, I had a structure. No one can tell me what to do. And if I'm in an ordered structure, I can't do what I want. So one would think they're opposites, maybe with attention, but they're opposites. In comes Judaism and says, not at all. They are completely reconciled. In fact, they need each other. And this also fundamentally teaches us about the nature of freedom in the Jewish imagination. Freedom is not the ability to follow my bliss. It's certainly not the notion that I can do whatever I want so long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. By the way, that might be the dumbest thing anybody ever said because everything we do helps or harms somebody else. Everything we do enhances or detracts from the lives of somebody else. There's no action we can possibly take that doesn't affect somebody for better or for worse. So, um, okay, so put so freedom, in other words, has to be done well, or the or our responsibility is to think, how do I do freedom well? So there's a great song um, about when about Moses, let my people go, but the biblical rendition never ends there. It's always let my people go so they might serve me. It's never let my people go, stop. It's let my people go because I want them to serve me. There's a purpose to freedom. So what does that do with order? So why, why do we glamorize or glorify order on the night of freedom? And I think it's the answer is the same as to, do I have the freedom right now to go play beautiful music on the piano in the other room? Well, on the one hand, you might say, well, there's nobody stopping you. It's not illegal. It would be a little strange and inappropriate, but I, you, I guess you have the freedom to do so. So in that sense, yes. But in a much more profound and real sense, absolutely not, because I don't know the order of music. I don't know what a chord is. So because I've not mastered the order of music, or frankly, know the first thing about it, the best I can do is bang on the keys. Whereas I can't do it well, all I can do is bang on the keys. So in order to do freedom well, it has to be done within a framework of order. I mean, John Wooden, the great basketball coach, he would begin in UCLA in the 60s and 70s, he would begin every season by teaching his players how to tie their sneakers. If, if, you're, gonna, if you're gonna play well, if you're gonna exercise freedom well, your sneakers have to be tied really well. In other words, you have to do with the framework of order. And the, the, uh, the, the title of the chapter of the book on this was related to a very interesting social science study, actually two of them that I found, which I thought profoundly related, even though they had nothing to do with anything Jewish, which asked the question, who are the most sexually satisfied people in America? Okay, so if we were asked that question, we'd probably say, I don't know, probably people who are young and unmarried and these days have no restraints and no one telling them what, what to do, they have no restraints in their time or they, they can do whatever they want them. Totally wrong. The most, according to these two studies that had huge populations fulfilling the data, the most sexually satisfied people are happily married religious people. Now that's two layers of order, right? One, marriage is of course order. And two, re being religious means I've, I've agreed to be within an even more ordered framework. Yet these are the most fulfilled and satisfied people. Teaching us that as human beings, if we want to do freedom well, we need to do it within a structure of order. And that's how we begin our Seder. So we begin the Seder by glorifying order. And only after we do that, only after do we commit ourselves to order, can the matzah start crumbling? Can the wine start spilling? Can the questions which may lead to subversive answers start being asked? All these great experiences of freedom, we're, we're, we're told they have to happen within order because freedom is not doing whatever I want. It's serving God. Um, so any questions about that or anything else, or should we pick another uh, another passage? Mark, I wonder if you could tell us why in the title of your book, 
Uh, it says that this Haggadah reveals the meaning of life. And how do you personally transmit that during the Seder? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it reveals the meaning of life in that I can't think of a great question of life that is not asked and answered in the Haggadah. Everything personal, psychological, social, political, it's all asked and answered, national, Jewish national, it's all asked and answered here. Um, and uh, so all the great questions that we wrestle with from a communal standpoint, a personal standpoint, a national standpoint, they're asked and answered in the Haggadah. So that to me is rolled up, what is it, what is it rolled up? It's the meaning of life. So here's, here's just an example. And it also teaches us about conceptions and misconceptions. Here's a misconception, which we're, we're hopefully about to clarify. This is, teaches us the definition of, the proper definition of humility. Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, this is after the Seder of B'nai Barak that everyone's familiar with. He's about 16 years old at the time. When he, we know that from the historical record. He said, I am like a 70 year old man. Now he's not saying I'm like a 70 year old man in my capacity as a high jumper. He's saying I'm like a 70 year old man in my capacity of wisdom. So leading us to say, wait, is this kid bragging? And if so, are we immortalizing the bragging of an adolescent in our sacred text? And the answer is, he certainly seems to be bragging. And yes, we definitely have immortalized him in our sacred text, which leads us to question, why are we doing so? I thought we were supposed to be a religion or a, a people who values, like lots of other people, humility. And the answer is, we do. So the question then is, well, what is humility? So, the, and I believe that that is resolved by what the great Christian writer C.S. Lewis said when he said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking about yourself less. Or what the rabbi, the Hobbes Chaim said, when he said false humility is a sin, because if you're falsely humble, if you have a great gift and you don't acknowledge it, if you have a staff in your hand that God gave you and you don't acknowledge it, you won't be able to be God's partner on earth to creating whatever God wanted you to create. So God has put a staff in each of our hands. He wants us to create something. We know that God always works with partners, even the 10 plagues he does with a partner, Moses and or Aaron, so God wants us to be his partner in something and we can figure, and how are we going to figure out what that thing is? By asking ourselves, what is my great strength? What am I great at? And that's what he's saying. He's saying, this young rabbi is saying, I'm great at being wise. Okay. He's saying, I'm not saying that because I'm congratulating myself. I'm not even really proud of it. I'm asking, how can I contribute this gift towards making the world a dwelling place for God? And it's such an important insight. And I think it was like so many things, the Rebbe Menachem Shearson, he said it so magnificently, whereas this famous line in the Talmud, which is that every Jew is a guarantor for every other Jew. Now, he said very rationally, well, when can you be a guarantor? You can only be a guarantor when you're richer than the person for whom you're guaranteeing. So if our child graduates college and says, will you guarantee the first year rent on my apartment? It only makes sense if we're richer than our child. And that was the Rebbe's point. When we say every Jew is a guarantor for every other Jew, what we're saying is that every Jew is richer than every other Jew in some way. And the same thing can be said about any community. You could say that everyone who's a member of uh, the synagogue or the PTA, whatever, is richer than everyone else in some way. And then how do I contribute that wealth to the betterment of the community? Now, if we say, yeah, there's nothing I'm really that good at or other people are as good as me, then what do we have to contribute? Nothing, we can't be a guarantor. Right, so this is such a valuable exercise to to maybe sit around the Seder table and you know or, you know getting back to what what uh, to Randy's question, one of the things that we might be able to do to make it meaningful is to say, look, I'm going to surprise you. I want everyone to say, what are you great at? In fact, what are you better than everyone else here at? And, and don't say nothing, and you know, uh, um, and and don't give some vacuous answer. Give a straight answer, and I'll tell you why I'm telling you this because we're trying to we're here on this great new year celebration to try to discover our place in God's world and how we can better ourselves in the world in the coming year. And unless you identify your great strength, you're not gonna be very good at it, but God gave you a great strength. So what is it? And then how are you gonna contribute it? And maybe if people can leave the Seder with nothing else except a knowledge of what is their great strength and how might they contribute it, that might be a Diana moment. Um, I'm curious about the, um... You know, in the, in the Haggadah, you get through the whole service, and then after the service is over, then there's all those songs at the end um, that are almost like a, a the 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 footnote of the, the after afterthought of, of the of the process. And how do you kind of interpret all those different songs? I don't know, I, I don't think the the topics of those songs are all pretty different too, right? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great question, Jacques. Now, in the book, I only address the biblically mandated part of the Seder, which is the M M Magid section, all the things we've been discussing. I didn't even cover that. I didn't even study it. Um, I'm sure there's a ton of wisdom in it, but my focus was on the Bible tells us that in Exodus 12 and 13 that effectively, doesn't use the term, but effectively tells us you're to do seders. It says that you're, you're to educate your children. We can talk about that in a minute because it's totally fascinating. But the songs at the end, I'm sure there's a lot of wisdom, but I, I just, I haven't studied it and don't have it in the book. But getting back to what we're actually doing at the seder that you reminded me of is so interesting. Now, imagine if somebody ran for office today and they did not say something like our children are our future or I wanna be the education president or senator. Imagine if someone didn't say that. We would say, what is wrong with you, right? Now, it may be trite now to say something like that, but it's a completely revolutionary idea. The fact that it's trite is only an indication that Moses and the Torah succeeded so massively. So, but it's an astonishingly radical idea. Why? So in Ex and it's all explained in the context of the Seder. So in Exodus 13, 14, Moses says, when your children ask you, to which I might reply if I were conversing with Moses, how do you know what my children are gonna ask me? Maybe you, I think Moses, you meant to say, if your children ask you, or should your children ask you? And he would have said, no. I said, when your children ask you, because what did Moses, the psychologist, know that every child has? Every child across the world has one, one, one thing in common. They're all curious. Like, you know, how many of us remember back to when our kids were two and three and the word they said 50 times an hour? Exactly. So um, therefore, Moses said, upon this, will I build the future of the Jewish people? It's the curiosity of the children that will allow them to last, as he said, forever. So how am I going to channel and execute upon the curiosity of the children? He said, I'm going to do so through mass education and universal literacy. This is a crazy idea anyone ever had. The alphabet had barely been invented when Moses said he was going to commit the future of the Jewish people upon universal literacy. So if people aren't sure that God wrote the Bible, I think God had a hand in it. I don't know who exactly did no human being would ever have come up with that idea at the time. There are barely any letters and someone says the Jewish people are going to live forever because everyone's going to know how to read and write and teach their kids how to do it. Impossible. No one ever thought of it. So, but Moses thought of it. And in fact, by the time of Josephus, the first century, every Jewish community um, was required to educate boys and girls in literacy by ages six or seven. So we've been doing it for a long time. And so we, Moses identifies curiosity. He invents education as the means of perpetuation and uh, encourages education through questioning, knowing full well that questions are going to lead to subversive answers and are going to lead to people coming up with all kinds of unpredictable responses. And he's good with it. And the proof of his success, we now all celebrate education. By the way, it took the world till the, until the 20th century to come around to universal education. I was talking to a British group yesterday, British Jewish group, and I said to them, you know, in 1391, your king made it a capital crime to educate the serfs. This was typical. Because why did King Richard I do that? Because he thought if the serfs were educated, then they could question authority. And who would, and what, what ruler would want their people to do that? Well, Moses did. And, uh, and here we are with this astonishing continuity because of the questioning, not in spite of it, but because of it. He knew, again, another God moment, he knew that completely counterintuitively, a people that constantly question would stay continuous. One would think it would be the opposite. You ask enough questions, you leave. You, 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 you leave. No, no, no. Asking enough questions, he said, you stay. And, and here we are. It's how many thousands of years later? Uh, any other questions or parts of the Haggadah? All right, well, here's another, here's another very interesting part, which I think is, um, and this also can get to Randy's question. Um, with 70 persons, your forefathers descended to Egypt, and now Hashem, your God, has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Okay, it's a fascinating passage. First of which, 70 persons. Now, um, what's interesting about that is there are only 69 names of people in the Torah who are listed in late Genesis who go down to Egypt. So if there are 69 people, why are we saying there are 70? Well, two choices. One, there has been a math error that nobody got around to correcting over the last several thousand years. Or two, there must be a profound reason for it. Obviously, it's going to be two. So what is the reason? Well, the reason I think is revealed in the fact that there's no Hebrew word for history. Again, if we have no word for something, no concept of saying, we don't need a word for it. We Jews have no notion of history. Um, my, when Maimonides talked about history, and he knew Arabic, of course, he, when he talked about history, 
he talked about the discipline of history, not as we do in such pious terms. He said, he talked about like he would comic books. He said, it's a useless diversion. We wouldn't even talk about comic books that way. He, why? So why did Jews have no notion of history, but a very rich conception of memory? Because history is a story of what happened to other people. Memory is the story of what's happening to us. Very different. So in the Jewish imagination, there's no them back there and us now. We are all part of the same story. So why are there 69 names and 70 persons? Because each of us is number 70, which I think is such an important part to say at the, um, and we'll get to Kathy's really good question in a moment, but th th it's such an important thing to emphasize at the Seder is that we're not telling the story of people who are long dead. We are participating in the story. We are all participants in the great Exodus story. Each of you is number 70. And then why are we compared to stars of heaven? If someone asked you right now, standing on one foot, describe the Jews, you wouldn't say, well, there are a lot of them, right? Well, probably not. But it's not so crazy to say that because think of all the other ancient peoples in the Bible, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Jebusites, the ancient Egyptians, they're all gone. There are none of them left. And yet we have 14 million Jews. From that perspective, any rational calculation at the time of the Bible would have predicted there will be no Jews in 2021. None. What kind of question is that? None. Yeah. So imagine not, not why there's so how self is well Rabbi says out that there are many acts of counting in the Torah. Yet we're we're absolutely forbidden in every census, there are about two or three of them in every census, it's forbidden to count people, which is why at a minion you don't go one to, you don't count to ten, people say a verse. You don't in, in the Bible, we never count people. Everyone has to put a half shekel into the pot. We count their contributions. So it's not how many Jews there are that matters, it's where the contributions of Jews that matter. So now we're beginning to see why it could be like stars. But that doesn't end there. What is the function of a star in ancient times? Well, by the way, Israel today is ranked one of the top 10 places in the world. Southern Israel, where the Bible would have been written, Southern Israel is one of the top 10 places in the world for stargazing. And my wife and I did, went on a stargazing tour in Southern Israel three years ago, it was incredible. And uh, we're not, we don't really know anything about stars, but it was an incredible experience just because you, you can behold it. So you see these stars and what do you, and what do you realize? Well, first, how did people in ancient times get around at night? Obviously before there's artificial light, they got around through what was called and what still is called stellar navigation. Stars are by what people in the darkness found their way. So that's who we should all be. We should all wanna be the people, the stars that when someone is lost, when someone wants to know where should I be going, we should all aspire to be that star that in the darkness of anyone's life, they look to the star and they say, I wanna follow him, I wanna follow her. Um, and so in navigation, interestingly, um, the US Army uh, in 1998 said, we now have GPS, we don't need it anymore. They brought it back 10 years later when, uh, when GPS hacking was invented. Or, and uh, the IDF never gave it up. So stellar navigation, the ability of the stars to show us the way at night is still taught by the greatest um, armed forces. And the other thing about stars is that Isaiah says that um, God knows each star by name. So no matter how many people there are, no matter how many stars there are, each person is unique and special to God. Um, so, so much about stars. And the other thing about stars is we look at the night sky, not so much in New York City, but maybe in Greenwich, you look at the night sky and you don't see a palace of light. You see stars, right? That we don't have to light up the whole sky, but we just create the light. And then that's, that's enough for others to follow. So why, what, all right, great question, Kathy. Why wasn't the actual story of the Exodus in the Haggadah? Well, great, great question, uh, like several answers. One, it teaches us about the nature of Jewish education. So who is not in the Haggadah? Moses, Joseph, and the women of the Exodus. Shifra, Pua, the uh, Egyptian midwives and Pharaoh's daughter, not in the Haggadah. How could you possibly tell the story of the Exodus without mentioning those heroes? It's actually impossible. We can't do it. So why aren't they in the Haggadah? To teach us a fundamental lesson about education, which is even a, any guidebook, even the greatest of all time, the Haggadah, is only that. We have to teach our children. So when we teach our children the story of the Exodus, at Seder and otherwise, we need to teach them about all these great personages in the Exodus story. The Haggadah is not gonna do our job for us. No guidebook will. Now, when we finally get to telling the story of the Exodus and the Haggadah, Kathy's right, we don't do it in any conventional way. We don't do the book of Exodus. We do it through the book of Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy 26, 8, 5 through 8, the farmer's declaration. So, and who's the farmer? Moses is imagining this farmer in a time, like what's a movie, in a galaxy far, far away. That's what he's doing. He's, he's imagining the farmer in a time in the future. So why doesn't he just straight up tell the story of the Exodus? The whole thing happens in the Exodus. Well, the authors of the Haggadah, they're telling us, they're telling us what Einstein told us. Einstein said, the imagination is the most important part of reality. So when we get around to telling the story of the Exodus, we do it through an imaginary man living in an imaginary time. And in my book, I go into who this man is and how the authors of the Haggadah conceive of the ideal Jew. But the important thing is that when we tell the story of the Exodus, we tell it using our imagination. And then we begin to think, why? Why is the imagination so important? And then we realize that all the decisions that we make in life are products of our imagination, all of them. When we decide, what do I want to have for dinner tonight? We're imagining, will I enjoy this or will I enjoy that? When we decide, should I marry him? We're saying, would I be happiest with him or with someone I don't know right now? When we're saying, should I take this job or otherwise? We're saying, would I be most satisfied in this job or another job? Everything's a product of the imagination. Most importantly, perhaps, when I think about on this new year, what kind of person do I want to become? Again, a product of the imagination. So the imagination, the Haggadah is teaching us, is the most important part of reality. So we tell the story in Deuteronomy through an imaginary man. This is an Aramean attempt to destroy my father. Then he descended to Egypt. That's right out of Deuteronomy 26. That's when we finally begin to, to tell the story. But we should also tell the story of the Exodus. We just have to do it ourselves. And Mark, I have, a, I have a final question for you that brings us right to 2021. And your discussion of imagination is the perfect segue. Oh, terrific. As we contemplate, in some cases, another Zoom Seder. Right. Any pointers? Is that, in the, is that going to be in the next edition? Or do you have any ideas? How no, keep... hopefully, hopefully, hopefully the next edition, we'll never have such a thing again. Um, but uh... okay. <laughs> agreed, agreed. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully that'll be the one anachronism. But um, uh, I don't think they work. Now that's, and I don't have any objection to using technology and all that. That's not the point. If, and if it works for somebody, great. There's no, but I don't think they work because the Seder is an intensely physical experience. Mm -hmm. You have to smell the smells, eat the food, see the crumbling matzah. And even when you have a conversation at the Seder table, I don't know how it works if you're looking at the computer to your left all the time. And like if someone's, you can't really sing in unison doing this. I don't think it works. And I think by not doing it that way, we also respect what it says in the Exodus text that it must be an, an experience shared among multiple households. So I think this year might be the year of preparation and last year. So let's think about how can we really prepare for the Seder? Now we should have it with our families, of course, and we should always be sure that the Bible tells us that the whole community of Israel must enjoy Seder, which I think it's part of the preparation. And I would say this is totally required to give money to a Passover relief fund. Um, because uh, it says the whole community of Israel has to enjoy it. So we have to, it's an expensive proposition. We have to be sure that everyone can, that we fulfill that biblical commandment. But in terms of preparation, and we talked before, just order this stuff on Amazon or wherever. And like, that's not the real preparation. The real preparation is what we're doing now. Like what are the existential questions from the Haggadah? But there's also one ritual that I would recommend, which is the night before, cleaning one's home of hamates. Now I talk in the book about this whole concept of, um, printing out a contract on the internet to sell our homemades to a Gentile is ridiculous and shouldn't be done because the notion of ownership is rich in the Bible, but it never applies to homemades. And I go through all the reasons as to why it's meaningful to get rid of the homemades and to have matzah. It's not, it's not a legal workaround, will not satisfy that. So what should we do? We should cleanse our homes of the homemades. We don't have to be obsessive about it. If we miss a crumb here and there, it's okay. But how do we do it? We do it with a brush, a pan, and a candle. And we do it by candlelight with the candle. Why by candlelight at night? Probably for the same reason why we have candlelit dinners, because there's something special about the light of a candle, which is very different from the light of an artificial light. It just brings a real seriousness and a serenity to this sacred task of removing the hamates. Now, why do we, and then so in the morning, what do we do? We either burn or discard the brush, the pan, and the candle. Okay, I get the brush in the pan, that touched hamates and hamates has got to be gone, but why burn the candle? The candle didn't touch any hamates because the only function of the candle was to search for negativity. And I think as we approach the new year, what we should do is say, what about myself do I want to change spiritually? I'm not going to look at the bad qualities in others. No, not, not this week. I'm going to say, what about myself do I want to change spiritually? And what about the rest of the world do I want to change materially? So I think this is the year of preparation. 
preparation of uh, the Rav Soloveitchik said, all holiness involves preparation. It's particularly true of Pesach. And, uh, and I think we should try to find what can be holy in the preparation, which is distinct from the preparation that would have been burdensome with what, with what the radio show um, uh, person who's interviewing me described. Like that's, let's find the holiness in the preparation. What can make us really understand the opportunities of a new year and who we can be and who we should want to be in the coming year and how we can become that. Wow, Mark, I, I think you actually may have inspired me to go downstairs and clean out a cabinet. <laughs> it's no. time. The, 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 March 26th. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us tonight. Uh, you. If you have not yet gotten the book, The Telling, now you know why you should have the book, The Telling. Thank you, Carolyn and Jacques, so much for bringing this to our community. Um, and I do wish all of you, those of you who I will not see between now and the 26th, a, a really uh, happy Pesach, a good Pesach. And as Margot pointed out, this may be a tough Pesach for some people uh, this year, but we're hoping, as Mark said, that we will never be in this position again. And thank right. you so much. Thank you. What a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks.